Hello and welcome back, all you friends and enthusiasts of conflict of laws and international private law. This is the second part of our lesson, uh, International Private Law and Conflict of Laws from a German point of view. Today, we will be dealing with a case study. So how do we apply that? What we heard in the first lesson about the theoretical backgrounds and foundations of international private law or uh, as I prefer the expression, conflict of laws. If you didn't see that and you might want to have some more information, you just watch that and you use the link you can see down there and you'll get the introduction to that because we are going to be talking about the theoretical backgrounds a little today, but I'm going to sum that uh, up and just come to the basic details of that. So the, the detailed information, the theories and how to apply that, all of that, you'll find in that first part of our lessons on conflict of laws. Um, this is the case I gave you last time. So that is the mail delay case. It's one which could actually take part in any nation worldwide or on an international basis. As you see that on the screen right now, uh, take your time and read that. If you forget about the case, read it. If you didn't read it before, now take your time and read it. I would advise you to read it minimum three times so you can keep in mind the basic facts of that and the data and all the details the parties actually did and agreed upon or did not agree upon in some cases. So take your time now to read that. Fine? You read that? Good. So these were the two questions which we put on the case last time. And the first one we already answered. To sum it up a little for you, uh, I'm going to give you a kind of uh, an introduction again. How do we work with that? And what we did is we tried to figure out how will a judge, in our case a German judge, work, work with an international private law, civil law case like that. And the first thing any lawyer would do when working on private cases, and that's almost a principle which is applicable worldwide, um, the lawyer, he or she, will ask him or herself and say, who wants what, of whom, based on which claim, okay? So, and then we would be starting to look for a claim and the parties and all of that. If we have an international case, there is some kind of a prerequisite or step number one in the checklist before that. And that's the question, does the case have international relations? If no, that's pretty easy. Then any court, any judge worldwide will simply apply his own national law and that's it. Um, if, on the other hand, we figure out it has international relations, the next question would be, um, which court is going to be deciding? Uh, and, and I have a, a separation, a differentiation for you, which is a kind of, let's say, misleading, because wherever you watch my video over here, uh, a national court, your home court, might be a different one than the German one. It could be the one in Texas, in Ghana, New Zealand, India, or Russia. So we just take an example, and since we are a German University of Applied Sciences um, and a German business school, we use the German courts as one of our examples for these cases, okay? So when we come to that uh, methodology, the first question a German court will ask is that, does the case have an international aspect like that? And for a German court, they will apply the introductory act to the German civil law code, which the abbreviation, the German one you can see over there, is EGBGB, very funny, uh, but only for the beginning. Once you try to apply it, you will not smile or laugh about that anymore. It's Article 3 of the introductory act to the German civil law code. And the second question then will be the qualification question, but we'll come to that afterwards. So. Moving on in our checklist, the checklist, the German court and the German judge would apply basically. The next question would be, I do ask Article 3 and Article 3 then gives the German court a possibility um, we, or gives the German court and the judges possibilities 
which laws they could actually apply. We have international conventions, we have EU regulations, especially one there for the business law part, it's Rome 1 and 2. And we still have some leftovers of the conflict of laws systems in the German law system. And that after a court has done that, these regulations of Article 3, either international convention, EU regulations, or international private law, the German version of that, which basically is only one article left over in Article 43 of the German Introductory Act to the Civil Law Code, they tell them which laws to apply. They, they definitely, most courts and judges worldwide will prefer uh, the right-hand side, the, the green one, it's application of national substantial law because lawyers and judges have been trained on that and they prefer to apply that. Um, if not possible, if these regulations and these norms in international conventions or in national conventions, national laws, force them to go abroad, well, they have to apply that. This again is Article 3. If you didn't read it by now, you should definitely do it now and then go through that. Uh, with the red letters in there, the red words in there, I try to point out the three possibilities I've shown you on the picture before. So we have the word at the beginning that's pretty, pretty important and it's actually carrying the, the whole strategy for the rest because it says unless, okay? So what we find under letters A and B, actually C, but this is not very relevant for the business law part. And what we find in number two, that all has to be applied before the judge is allowed to use the German international private law system, still regulated in the articles three and the following ones to far back the 48 and something like that in the introductory act to the German civil law code. Okay, now, which one shall we apply? What shall we do now? Shall we use the Rome 2 regulation about the non-contractual obligations or shall we use Rome 1? Or what, what shall we apply? And the key for that, that is the second part of the methodology of conflict of laws. You've got to qualify the claims possible. The good news about that is that we are using the same qualification as we always use them to qualify the claims and private law systems and for private laws use. We have contractual claims, we have claims based, based on rights and RAM, and then we have a group of statutory claims, but they're pretty different, all three of those. It's uh, about the agency of necessity, the law of torts, and the unjust enrichment. Okay, you got to make sure you somehow know what the different types of claims are characterized by. And if you know so, then you can move on with the qualification in international private law or in the conflict of law system. And this is the good news. It's, it's pretty easy to figure out what's going on over there. So if you say, or if you figure out, in my case, it's a contractual claim I'm talking about. It's a sales contract, a service contract, a rental contract, uh, a leasing contract, a know-how contract, whatever. Um, the answer you will find, the answer on which laws to be applied, you'll find in Rome 1 or in some kind of an international convention. And for our purposes over here, we chose the, the CISG as a pretty good example, the Convention on International Sale of Goods for Sales Contracts, okay? Uh, the claims based on rights in REM, we don't, still don't have an, an international or European regulation about that. So the German court would have to apply our own international private law system or the, or the conflict of law system which is situated in Article 43. And then Rome 2 is covering all, all of the statutory claims. So that's pretty easy. And that, that, that's nice to apply. You just have that separation. We have five possibilities and they already tell you where to go. So it's not that kind of witchcraft or wizardry. We have to apply a rocket science. It's pretty much just a question of logic we are working with. And now the court 
knows what to do, more or less, actually. We have these three possibilities. Article 3 says qualify it, please. And if you're qualified it, go one of the three ways over there. Go with the international conventions, go with the regulations, or use the German version of that. Okay? Good. So um, maybe you might consider that to be an, an oxymoron or whatever. Uh, what comes now is uh, a creative part for lawyers. So, you know, oxymoron is that lawyers are not very famous for being very creative and having a lot of fantasy. But you would have to look at the case now and be creative. So what, what type of claim could that be we were talking about? And now looking at our case with the CD players and a price and a delivery and all of that, uh, most people will say, Boof, um, that's a sales contract. And since our Article 3, number 2 of the German Introductory Act to the German Civil Law Code or the, the German abbreviation of that, EGB, it's just a question by the way, are you still laughing about it or is it me mind serious? Okay, so it's just a joke. So when you look at that, you say, oh, um, let's look for an international convention. And yes, the, the, the CISG, the Convention of International Sale of Goods, is such a convention. It could be applied over here. And the fine thing is we did that more detailed in the last version in our Conflict of Laws Lesson one, part one uh, presentation on, on uh, YouTube um, is, or the good news is um, these new, well, what's new? It's more than 50 years old, by far more than 50 years old now. But these conventions define themselves when they want to be applied. Okay, that, that's good. So the first part would be Article 1a that gives you a hint and says, well, if both par parties are situated in contracting states, fine, fine. Uh, let's go for the CISG as long, and you've always got to keep that in mind, as long as the, the parties didn't exclude the application of the CISG. How one could do that will be uh, uh, the topic in one of the letter of our lessons about conflict of laws and the international private law systems from a German point of view. Okay, so fine, we have Germany, we have France now, but the question is, are these contracting states, how do, we, do you know? Um, well, one of the easiest ways to figure out would be you just punch into your headline on your browser, um, contracting state CISG, and whoops, you will come to some place showing you that type of schedule or maps or whatever. What you can see over there, I'm pretty far ahead of my time, uh, 2020 December. This video is taken in May actually, so I'm sorry it's a uh, printing error. It should be May 2020, but well, after a while that will be covered by the time. Good. Now let's have a look at the contracting states over here. And what we see is following the alphabetical order, uh, we have France over there. It's one, two, three, fourth line from the top. And it's the second column, there's, the, there's France. And then we move on to the right a little, okay, we have Gabon and Georgia. And then comes up Germany. So Germany and France are both contracting states. And that means that in our case, we will have to apply the CISG and a, a German court at least would do so. In most of the countries you have seen on the picture before, um, the courts will do so. They will apply that as long as the parties didn't agree upon the fact that they say, oh, no, we don't want that. Okay, good. Now coming to the second question, and that's pretty, pretty common style now. Um, if your client comes to your office <laughs> and to your law firm and says, you know, what do I get? And you give him the answer, oh, we will apply the CISG. He says, fine. But what does that give me? Or actually, if you're the representative of the plaintiff, uh, does that give me something? So now we have to check the material law part of that. Does the 
the buyer in our case, does the buyer have a claim on delivery with a result that afterwards he might get a judgment saying, yes, the seller has to deliver. And if the seller doesn't want to do that, we can use a state authority to execute that. We would call that enforcement of a judgment. But that's going to be a later part of our lessons. So you can be pretty excited. There is more to come up, all right? So now we are, we are back in, in our normal schedule and uh, procedures. Who wants what from whom? We already checked that. We, we know that. Um, now we need a claim for the plaintiff. In our case, the, the buyer is the plaintiff. And uh, so we have to look for claims for that, applying the CISG. And that is something which occurs to any lawyer, judge, or just uh, some kind of legal expert worldwide, you know what to use. Now you've got to, you've got to search for that. And uh, as in any good cooking show, I prepared some tiny little hints for you um, with the claims of the parties in the CISG. And the good news and the structure is you got, you got to think, you got to firstly separate, okay? Uh, the buyer has different interests than the seller because the buyer wants the goods and if the goods are not good, he wants reduction price or damages or whatever or an extra substitute delivery or what else he might have. And the seller has different interests. The seller wants money and if it's not there in time, he wants interest rates and maybe he wants them on a special bank account or whatever. So since the interests are pretty different of the parties, we have different uh, claims for the parties. And the first one for the buyer, that's pretty obvious that we call that a primary claim. A primary claim because this is primarily what the buyer wants, okay? He wants possession, property of the goods he is about to pay for. If that goes wrong, if there's something wrong, he wants some kind of a claim from breach of contract, reduction of price, damages. I mentioned that before. And there are other articles uh, regulating that. The seller, due to his different interests, has different articles, different claims in the CISG. And he might have, or we have, we'll have to refer to that. Good. So now we come back to our case and say, now it's the buyer who wants something. Or what does the buyer want? We are at the very first stage of a, of a contract. And the very first stage of a contract is I, I want what I actually ordered, okay? So th that is our, our claim we have to work on. And that might be the claim we will fill in in our schedule, our method of checking um, civil law suits and, and civil law claims, okay? Good, so if, if you've got it so far, fine. If not, use the possibilities of these electronic learning devices and, and go back and listen to it once more, okay? Then get, get on it. And those of you knowing who I am and found my email address, well, so you just mail me and say, there's something wrong, I didn't understand that and that. You're wholeheartedly invited to give me some information and the feedback on the lessons over here. So we move on, okay? So we're still with the civil law cases. We're still with the methodology of checking the substantial part of a claim. And we can answer the first one or two questions already. We can say, well, we know that the, the buyer wants the CD players, okay, from uh, the seller and their different states. We've checked that already. We know what they want and the price, all of that is set, okay? Now the qualification was it's a contractual claim. And since it was a contractual claim, we've been searching for a contractual basis for that or a legal basis for a sales contract. And what we found was Article 30. And now um, it's going to be a pretty boring procedures. All the, the lawyers worldwide will go through. And maybe this is because they call us P counters and any other nice words uh, our clients might give us afterwards after we run the cases for them. Um, we we got to find the prerequisites and, and in a very decent, very specific, logical order, okay? So you can only have a contractual claim if you have a, a contract. Otherwise, you don't have a contractual claim. And if you want a contractual 
claim from a sales contract, you've got to have a sales contract, okay? And what's the prerequisite for a, for a sales contract? But the first one is we need an offer. Ha ha, surprise, you knew that before. If you don't, now you know. And uh, the, the second would be we need a valid acceptance. Oh, surprise, surprise, you actually didn't think about that. Maybe you have done that type of deal since your days of kindergarten or something like that already. Okay, so that these are the prerequisites. But now I uh, promise it's going to be a little more legal and more technical now from that on. Both of these offer and acceptance, they are called declarations of intention and to make them valid. You need two valid declarations of intention and offer and an acceptance to make these two valid. Well, you, you, you need the prerequisites for these declarations of intentions to be fulfilled. Um, what you can see on the left hand side now from your point of view, that is, let me have a look at my cupboard over here. Okay, got it. Um, that is, we need a, a valid offer. Okay, and uh, a valid offer is uh, carrying the essentials of the contract. If you want it a little more sophisticated, you don't say essentials of the contract or essentials of the deal. You call it with the Latin word essentialia negoti. And um, since I've been tortured for seven years with uh, the rules of Latin, trying to, to learn how to translate all these old texts in a dead language, I'm going to torture you with that as well. <laughs> it's my little revenge. And uh, we call it the essentialia nigori. It's nothing else but the essential of the contract. Now, what are the essentials of the contract? It's pretty easy. It's the, the price, the good, and the parties. Otherwise, it's not it. And somehow that, that declaration of intention got to be issued. It got to be dispatched or whatever. If I just feel like buying a Ferrari, the Ferrari dealer just know that I want a Ferrari. So I got, somehow I got to give him a notice about that. And that would be called issuing or uh, dispatching it. And on the other hand, well, it's got to reach the, the other person, got to reach the dealer or whoever with that. Um, so let's have a look at these parts. What, what makes a declaration of intention a declaration of intention? And that's the same for both, for the offer and for the acceptance part of that. And already the name tells us it's a, a declaration of intention. Declaration is something objective, a noticeable activity. I got to call, I got to send an email, I got to talk, I got to negotiate. Maybe if you still have these old machines, you have to send a fax or whatever. So you, you use that. It got to be some kind of a noticeable activity so the partner knows that's it. It can be pretty uh, reduced information, so you might have seen in some kind of James Bond movies or, or others, where a, a pretty precious declaration of intention and offer during a, an auction is made by just raising the hand in a very cool style and doing like that, and that's an offer of another ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars, maybe half a million or something like that. Okay, so the objective part. You can prove that with evidences like witnesses or letters or whatever. It's much more complicated with the intention part, the subjective part of that. Because what you do got to be a conscious activity. You would say, well, well Mr. Bank, fine, fine. But what the hell should be an unconscious activity? Well, an unconscious activity could really be if you drop in front because you fall asleep or something like that. And in an auction, the auctioneer has gone and pointed you, oh, you're nodding your head. That would be an unconscious activity. Or even if just a, a bee or some other kind of dangerous insect is flying directly towards one of your eyes, you might go like that and that might be interpreted as a conscious activity. Hmm. Not very realistic, but things happen. So that's it. Uh, more important is the second part of that. Um, people giving a declaration of intention must be aware of the fact that what they just do right now has legal consequences. So actually, let's stick with the, with the example of the, the auction situation. If somebody uh, goes there and, and goes into a room and doesn't really realize what's going on in there, it's an auction, we know that already. 
And then he sees a friend and says, oh, hi, how are you? And then he gets a very, very ugly picture for a very, very high price. No, 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 no. I, I didn't want to give some kind of an offer or something like, oh my God. Um, I just wanted to, to greet my friend. And, and that's a little problematic, actually, we would have to look at. But for the time and for our case, it's not relevant because when we look at what the parties did over here, that didn't seem to be one of the major problems, but whether they were aware of the legal consequences of their activities or not. Okay, so let's come back to our offer. Um, basically, there is nothing special about that besides the details I just showed you. One thing about the offer is interesting, and you should look at that and <laughs> see it uh, <laughs> once more. I'm going to torture you with the with my Latin knowledge. Okay, told you seven years. That's a long time to work on Latin. Thank you to my uh, Latin teacher, Miss Schilling. Okay, she was, but you might not be interested in that. So, um, and is it an offer already? That's the question, or is it an invitation to offer, or I just just for uh, to 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 appear more sophisticated? Is it only a, an, an invitation to offer? Okay, invitatio ad offerendum. That's the Latin word for that. Um, now, when you have some such thing, such thing such as uh, um, shop windows, when you have uh, public offers in the newspapers, by the television set, by the lawnmower, whatever, that's not really binding, okay? Because when you when you see a very nice shirt in a in a in a shop window, you go in there and want that one, and the other one says, "I don't have it in your size anymore." You will not blame him and, and sue him for damages because the shop window just wants you to go in and make an offer yourself. Same thing with the advertisement you'll you find on the television or somewhere in the newspaper, whatever. It's just come and make me an offer. If I still have the stuff, if I have the style you want, then it's going to be it. Now let's transfer that uh, to our case. And then the, the offer could have been the letter uh, SN on the 28th of February. Okay, I mean, we got to differentiate that a little and we need an argumentation for that. And this is what you will have to do if you write an expert opinion, give some kind of detailed argumentation why, from your point of view, this is an offer and not an invitation to offer an invitatio at offerendum only. Okay, and then you got to, because there is no further description in the laws. Um, you've got to work with indications. What is an indication that this already should have been an, an offer and not only an invitation to offer an invitatio ad overendum? Uh, I, good cooking show, I prepare that for you as well. Um, we have a limited number of addressees, even though it's a, a big number, but it's a limited number of addressees. We have very pre precise information in that first letter already about the details, the goods and the price and the parties and all of that. And, and that seems to, to be the most convincing argument uh, about that. There is a time limit set. And if you just want people to invite, if you just want to invite people to, to give you an offer or something like that, you would not set a time limit for that. It would be silly, okay? But you set a time limit if you actually want them to react and to be bound. Now I have to have a sip of coffee. Thank you for your patience. Um, you, you, you say, I'm going to keep the goods for you for a while. Oh, but after a while, I got to know whether I'm going to send it for you because keeping goods on stock, you know, that, that costs you money and all that. So these three indications definitely, uh, I, I tend to say almost any court worldwide would say that that's already an offer. It's, that's perfect what it should be. Um, it was sent towards the other ones, uh, submission, dispatching, is issuing these, these offers. I know that most of us will not like the, the normal postal service anymore. Some of us call them in a kind of an insulting way in the, a snail mail method or whatever, but still it is a, a perfect way to dispatch that. And you can see that from Article 24. Uh, on the other hand, and then that's the interesting part, 
um, the offer becomes valid the moment it reaches the other party, okay? And that is um, and what I was just looking up and what, what I try to look up and get just now. That is my printout of the, the CISG and you should do the same now and, and, and read it. What's in there? Um, Article 15, CISG, you got it? Take your time, get it, have a look at it, all right? And off, an offer becomes effected when it reaches the offeree, okay? So the offerer will offer that to the offeree and then it's valid at that moment already. Now, when is it uh, reaching the other person? You will find that, have a look at that as well. And then really please read it, Article 24 of the CISG. For the purposes of this part of the convention, offered a declaration of acceptance or any other indication of intention reaches, very nice with the hyphens, the address C when it is made already to him or delivered by any other means to him personally to his place of business or mailing address. Okay, so what is described over there in Article 24 uh, is called the mailbox theory. Um, mailbox theory, that means that the, uh, the offeree that um, he does not have to read that or that the other party has to read that. It's just got to be in his mailbox. So the possibility is existing that he could take notice from it any time. And then, then from that moment on, it's valid. And maybe we have time to look at another case and another lesson um, that can be pretty difficult and that can be pretty challenging and uh, decisive for a case, okay? Good, so we definitely have an offer, it is valid, okay, and it reached the, uh, the offeree, that, that's fine. Now the second question is we, we need for a contract, we don't only need an, an offer, but we, we also need an acceptance for that. And the acceptance, that's Article 18. So please excuse me if I forget to tell you every time, but. Every time you see a new article popping up on the window, um, you, you should read it, please. Okay, take your notes, print it out, or have a second screen, or s split the screen, whatever you might have to do. But it's very, very hard to understand what, what lawyers, judges, and I am talking about, as long as you don't need, don't read, and don't know what the, the text of these laws is. The definition of that, the declaration of intention, the acceptance as a declaration of intention is exactly the same as it was before. We need a noticeable activity. Well, that's the letter. We got to have a conscious activity. Well, it's, it's, there's no hint that, um, that acceptance was given in an unconscious state or something like that. And definitely, if you order stuff like that, you, you're definitely away, uh, aware, I'm sorry, you're aware Oh, the fact that this has legal consequence, you'll have to pay the price afterwards, okay? So let's look at that. Um, the content of the letter, it was dispatched, it was issued, Article 81, it was received by the offerer, 18224. So again, it's the, the very same structure again, so that means that this acceptance is, is valid, okay? We, we were sure about that. If you're in doubt about that, try to follow that and read the articles. It makes things a lot easier. So now there's the but. And, and I think a lot of you might have sit in, 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 in a set of in front of the screen for, for minutes now. Ah, oh, Mr. Banker, don't you see that there's something late that, that doesn't work like that? Yes. I know I, I saw that before, and um, I prepared prepared some some kind of uh, information about that. What I, I advise you, what I would advise you to do, um, is you read that article eight in second sentence, and you draw some kind of an intermediate result from that. Okay, and say if you, if the case would stop over here. Um, that would mean the acceptance is not valid because there was a time limit set. The time limit was not kept. Why ever? 
Okay, let, let, let's be, let's just be it as it is. Whatever, there is no contract. And basically at that state, there is no claim. I can almost hear you yell in front of your screens over there. Yes, I know. There is an exemption from that rule. And that exemption is going to be found in Article 21, second paragraph. And what you see down there, the, the red sentence or the red letters, that is the legal consequence of that article under certain circumstances. Under certain circumstances, it is possible that an acceptance which was actually late is deemed not to be late. So we, we act as if it was in time, but only if all of these prerequisites are fulfilled. This is a very basic case. It's about the, the, the strategy of uh, lawyers working with the cases going to introduce that methodology to you a little. So please now take your time and read that article 21 second paragraph very, very carefully. Okay, do that for me, please, or for your own sake, or I don't know what, maybe for the aunt or your grandmother paying for your studies, I don't know. Okay, you do that. And read it, have a look at it, and read it one by one. And if you want to, I don't see you. <laughs> it's a problem. We could have a vote. We could vote and, and decide how many prerequisites do, do you see. I, I told you, this what we do over here is a, is a very good cooking show. <laughs> so I prepared a, a little different style of that audio. 21 second paragraph, but read it as it is now and then take your time. Try to guess how many prerequisites are in there. We would have to check afterwards. And then this is what it looks like now. The green is the legal consequence. The late acceptance is effective as an acceptance. Okay. And then comes another prerequisite. It's a dangerous one. Now let's count. One we need a late acceptance. Two, it must have, must, be, must have been sent under some circumstances that normally it would have reached the offerer in time, the other party in time. Three, it must be possible for the offerer, in our case, usually the other party, to realize there was something going wrong. And this is why I have to react somehow, because now um, number four is if the offerer in our case, the party who sees, which could, or the party who could have seen that this letter is late, that this acceptance is late, um, that party has to inform the other one, I'm sorry, you were late. I, I cannot deliver the goods anymore. I cannot react on your declaration, whatever type it was of intention anymore. And I use the different color for number four because this is what we call a negative prerequisite. If that did not take part, then the late acceptance is effective as an acceptance, okay? Now, this is the version that's the more or less, well, should we call that the chaotic or the confusing version. And if you put that in a line, which is in a checklist, more or less, that's what lawyers would do. It would look like that. Okay. So first, we would have to check, is there a declaration of accept acceptance received late? Yes. Okay. It was late. It should have been there, and now I'm taking my case study myself. Um, it should have been there by March 16th, but it was there in March 19th. So the acceptance was late, was received late. No, no question about that. Second, in such a way, it should have been sent that it would have reached the offerer in time. Now, the answer, the acceptance was sent on March 6th, okay? And for 10 days, it was on the way because of that strike. 
even if we consider to be the normal male, a snail male, um, within Europe, two, three, four days are by, are by far sufficient. You, you, you normally can count on that, that they would deliver the, the, the letters and your services and parcels, whatever you have in, in that time span. So normally it would have been there in time. And three, the offer could have realized that because as it says in the text over here, it was on the news and the radio, television, and what else did we have? The papers, they all were talking about that strike and, and you, would, you would know that, okay? And now the last one, and this is why it's, it's in red, it's, it's a more complicated one. If the offer does not give a notice to the, uh, to the buyer, okay, to the acceptor of the, uh, of the offer, then, and he didn't do so, he simply said in the way, oh, I don't have the stuff anymore. So yes, there was no notification. Now our exam acceptance is deemed not to be late, okay? That, that is the result from that. And for those of you having worked on the uh, mail delay case, national, a German case, okay, you will say, oh my God, we, 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 that, that's the same result we had before. It's the same in the German law system with completely different paragraphs and completely different sections and articles or whatever we might have in there. But that's the sense of that case. And this is what we call comparison of laws. So in that case, the CISG and the German law system will come to the same result with almost the same type of content of articles, but in completely different sources, okay? The one is in the German civil law code, it's 100 and I don't know what, and over here it's 21 of the, the CISG, okay? So that's the same, but in different, and you, in different laws, rules, and you will have to find that. That's the fascinating thing about uh, conflict of laws and the international private law system, at least. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer, but um, it's, it's the fascinating thing um, for me. We will have other cases in, in which that might be different, and that, so you feel the excitement going on. It's very interesting what we do now, and we will, uh, we will go with that. Okay, so let's the, sum up the whole thing. These were our questions, who, once what, from whom, we answered that. We found a possible claim. We checked via the prerequisites for the claim. I don't see any objections again. What should the other party now say? There is nothing which is of legal relevance. There are no exceptions to the claim. It's too long ago, whatever. So the conclusion is, B, the buyer has a claim against S, the seller, based on a contract, which is described in Article 30 of the CISG, and the seller has to deliver the CD players. If he doesn't do so, we can enforce that, or if all the CD players are gone worldwide, then uh, most likely um, the buyer will get damages, uh, but that got to be checked in another civil law case study as that one with the same method methodology and we would have to find out which laws are applicable and does the uh, substantial law system really give the buyer a claim on damages now. So my ladies and gentlemen, fans and addicts of conflict of laws, I guess, I hope so. Hope you enjoyed the case today. Very nice. Uh, thank you for listening. Try to follow that. The nice thing about electronic learning is stop it, repeat it whenever you want, do whatever you want to do. Um, for the time being, all the best. And that video was taken during the times of Corona worldwide. All the best and stay healthy. Hope to see you again in Conflict of Laws Part 3. See you then. Bye-bye. Wholeheartedly yours, Bernd Bunker.